Okay, well, I'm going to welcome on uh, University of Idaho graduate, Sean Kramer, big time yes. journalist. Oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had a little bit of yes. Idaho in my, in my room as Absolutely. well. Anywhere we go, oh. it's Vandal yeah. territory, right? Gotta be. Yeah. So you're That's all the way, totally. yeah, exactly, 2014. So you're all the way in Taiwan. Not mm -hmm. a typical place for many Americans. Explain how no. you got there and, and your situation. Well, I, I was doing sports journalism out of college, um, uh, covering Idaho athletics. Um, and after a couple of years, I wanted to expand my, my career. Um, so I decided to move abroad to go teaching. Uh, I was looking at, you know, places like South Korea or Japan, but I kind of, I visited Taiwan and I, I, fell, in, I fell in love with it here. Just, um, it's, it's kind of like a, a metropolis, but it's also a low key, area where you can meet new people but still run into the same people and, and and the culture here is very friendly and the people here are great and uh so i just fell in love with it and now i'm here staying here and how did you get to covering taiwan professional baseball how did that happen well it's all happened so quickly you know the not many people knew about the baseball league here it's a, it's a small four-team league you know the players don't make that much money compared to even South Korea or Japan. Uh, many of the foreign players in South Korea make twice as much as the foreign players here. Um, but obviously, with COVID nineteen, when people started to realize that they were not going to get Major League Baseball this year, they very very quickly latched on to, to to Taiwanese baseball. Especially when the leagues did such a great job creating English language broadcasts. You can watch every baseball game in Taiwan now with English language commentary. Um, and once that happened, fans latched on very quickly. After that, I, I reached out to the league because I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to help. Um, they got back to me. Um, now we're going to launch an English language content website, cpblworld.com, uh, where all will be doing feature stories. Um, I was at the game Friday night, the first professional baseball game in the world with fans inside the stadium. And uh, so my next story will be on that. And I cannot imagine what that feeling was like. Just, we'll get right into it. Describe the emotion. I saw in some of your tweets, the second that you're in that stadium and you're a big baseball fan in general. I know you're a big Mariners fan. Um, Badly. So you've been through some adversity. Um, yeah. that, the feeling of seeing fans come in after the entire world has not had an, a live experience of sports. Uh, what was that feeling like for you? Yeah, it, it was very emotional. You know, I'm a person who, sports have been very important to my life and, and building my relationships with, with people and, and, and building a relationship with my communities. Um, you know, I, I'm a big believer in, in the things that sports can do, you know, for people emotionally. And, and you know, I, I might not be able to go home this summer and might not be able to go to T-Mobile Park, you know, a special place for me. But for the people here in Taiwan who who really work together, you know, as a, as a community, as a, as a culture to to fight this pandemic, uh, you know, so, so that they can lead as normal lives as possible for them to be in that ballpark. It's just for them, it was less like a relief and more just a reaffirmation that they're doing the right things. And, and and really encouraging them to keep doing what they're doing. There was there was a lot of happiness. You know, uh, the home team, Football Guardians, they won the game. But, you know, when there's a home run, you can't hug, you can't high five. So they were doing, like, air fist bumps and, like, pointing at each other. Uh, you know, in, in Taiwan, they do, like, coordinated songs for players. And so, like, that was really fun being able to watch that. And it was, it was emotional because it's just a reminder that um, – you know, there is a lot of bad things happening in the world right now, and I definitely wish the best for, for, for everybody back home. But in, but in Taiwan, there, there's a, a big feeling of hope, and, and this baseball league is a big part of that. So, so cool. Leading up to this, the Taiwan Baseball League had only been delayed, or had it been delayed because of how well they were dealing with the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic? Uh, 19 pandemic. Yeah, so uh, the league usually starts in late March. Um, they started spring training really early because there was supposed to be an Olympic baseball qualifying tournament in Taiwan in April. Uh, but when they pushed that back, 
uh, players had been in spring training for like 10 weeks um, and they pushed the start date of the league back one month to April 22nd. Um, and then they started playing for about three, four weeks behind closed doors. Um, and that's when they got the English broadcast out. And so a lot of foreign fans started paying attention. And now um, from this point on, um, they will let 1,000 fans into each game. Um, and they're, they're, they're spaced out. So every fan, how they did it on Friday night, every fan had two seats to their left, two seats to the right empty, and the row in front of them and the row behind them were also empty. Even families had to adhere to this. So 1,000 fans. Um, but uh, I was told um, by the president of the Fubon Guardians that um, they're going to try and do 2,000 fans as soon as next week. Wow. And I also saw on one of your tweets that couples might be able to sit together. Families maybe might sit together. Yeah, as well. yeah I think because, I mean, they're, they're going to go home to the same household anyway. So I think that's, that's kind of the argument. But they need to do, you know, first steps first, you know, first things first. So once I think this proves to be a success, yeah, families will be able to sit together. Um, couples will be able to sit together. And that way you can still safely fit maybe like 2,000 people in there. You talked about how Taiwan has really handled this situation well they have very few cases for their massive population of 23 million or around that yep. amount. Mm -hmm. uh, but what was the admission process like and how yeah. I know in some places they're using temperature thermometers across the forehead before you get to come in or just really slowly integrating people in because there's, you don't want to yeah. get too close to them. What was the admission thing like? Yeah, yeah. you, uh, they had a big, body temperature scanner so you would stand like in the circle and it would scan your body temperature one person at a time then they had to go up the stairs um and there were tables set up with uh forms they had to declare um where they had traveled the last 14 days and if they have come in contact with anybody who was quarantined or had a positive case once they filled that form out then they were able to go to the front gate give their ticket alcohol spray then they go in and they each have assigned seats. They cannot move around their seats during the game. So <clears throat> the first fan was let in about an hour before first pitch. However, many fans who had lined up before the game were still missing first pitch. Um, I, I, I think they, they want to work on that and, and um, get it faster, but they also have to be safe. So um, fans could also do it on the phone app. And so the, the president team was kind of a little frustrated that not a lot of fans use the app uh, because they have to fill out that form every game that they come. So hopefully they'll streamline it a, a little bit more, but it was, it was time consuming, but it was also safe. Almost like going through customs in an airport, like on yeah. steroids. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It really was. Yeah. Yeah. You had to get your bag checked and everything. Yeah. I feel like I have to ask, like, could people leave and go to the bathroom? I mean, there's, there's no, there's no, oh, yeah, 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 there's yeah, no yeah. food, but people, you can go. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, there was no food in the stadium. Uh, you can't bring food. They didn't sell food. Um, there was water. So yeah, you could leave, go to the bathroom, get water and stuff. It's just when you're in the seating area, you can't like go up to your friends and stuff. In terms of the players, their interactions, we're used to high fives and fist bumps and chest bumps and, yeah. and in Korean baseball and Japanese baseball as well, some bat flips too. And I'll get to yeah. that. But <laughs> with the players celebrating and interacting with each other, what, how different was that from what you're used to in Major League Baseball? Um, well, I think the player interaction with themselves have been, has been kind of normal, uh, you know, especially if they're wearing batting gloves and stuff like that, but there's definitely a lot more elbow, elbow bumps and stuff like that. And a lot of their celebrations, they don't really need to be touching. They, every team has their own like home run dugout dance, like, uh, the Rakuten monkeys do the, do the, the coffin dance from Ghana. They'll do that after a home run. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, you don't really have to be like touching and hugging each other and being all over each other for that. And so I think for the players, it's been normal with each other. What's different and frustrating with, for the players is that they can't interact with fans. Um, you know, Taiwanese baseball is a lot more intimate when it comes to fan player interaction. Um, for the Guardians, a lot of fans will go before the game to the team bus and deliver like tea and cakes and snacks to the players. Um, but obviously they can't let that happen now. Um, and one player, Brian Woodall, talked to me about how frustrating it was. You know, when fans will come up, can I take a picture? Can you sign this? 
and he has to say no, but he feels really bad about it because he has to explain why. And, um, you know, it takes a lot away um, from the reason that a lot of players come here to Taiwan. So, um, but, you know, we all have to do our part uh, to make sure that, that we can keep baseball, that we can keep fans coming into the stadium. And hopefully if we do that, you know, by the Taiwan series in the fall, um, you know, we'll be back to normal. Overall from the fans, I know you don't speak Chinese, but did you get a yeah, a little bit? Okay, nice. Um, did you get any sort of reaction from fans on during the game or afterward of how it went and how it felt and how important it was to them to get that kind of experience? Yeah, I, I talked to two different fans and they both literally said the words, baseball is life. Um, uh, to, to the baseball fans here, baseball is really important. Um, uh, the first fan ever in the world I got to talk to her, um, Win Shan Lin, um, she went to over 100 Fubon Guardians games last year. She was really confident that at some point she would be able to come back. But when she heard that she could come back this soon um, from her coworkers who told her the news, she was absolutely ecstatic. Um, and when she came in, I could just see in her eyes, you know, when the way she was looking at the field, you know. Um, another fan I talked to, he brought his two young children and his wife to the stadium. Um, he's a fan of the team kind of far away on the other side of the country. So when they come up here, he goes to see them all the time. And he was a little more worried, you know, because he said, you know, every summer it's an important family activity. His, his kids were waving the flags and stuff. They're really into it. So he was worried, you know, if we can't do this, um, you know, it kind of affects, you know, the way that we build our summers around family activities. So they were really happy. Um, they're really proud of, of Taiwan and the way that Taiwan has handled it. And, um, you know, they're, they're really proud to be able to be a part of, of normalcy, you know, coming back to the ballpark, doing it safely. So the quality of baseball probably not quite the same as, as major league baseball, but with all this celebration stuff, I mean, let's actually, let's just first talk about just kind of compare the quality of baseball to mm -hmm. the major leagues. And obviously you see some guys, former Mariners prospects come yeah. from Taiwan, but just kind of talk about that difference. Yeah, there are a couple of former major league players. Um, Ariel Miranda, I think is a player that a lot of viewers in Spokane will know well. He plays pitches here in Taiwan. Um, Ariel Miranda was maybe an above average major league player but he's probably one of the most elite players here in Taiwan. The general level would probably be high A baseball, which maybe Spokane Indians, yep. to maybe double A. Uh, there's a lot of players here who have played in triple A. There's a good amount of players here who got some major league baseball experience. Um, so, I mean, you have players who kind of achieved on all levels, but the totality is probably between high A and, and, and double A. There's a lot of offense, a lot of hitting, uh, a lot of home runs. You know, the pitching quality, not a lot of strikeout pitchers, uh, more kind of pitch to contact type pitchers. Um, uh, defense, you like defense, don't watch this league. Um, <laughs> there's good outfield play, but the infield play needs work. But uh, it, it's a fun league. It's, it's hard to predict. Some of the games can be exciting, big innings. So, yeah. Good to know. So, I can tell just from the mascots and cheerleaders. I know yes. that that some of these Asian sports leagues are kind of like MLB. If MLB were to go into like a rave situation, like there's lights and dancing and yeah. singing, and what's some of the funny stuff? Songs, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the the fans all have coordinated songs for for certain players that come with dances, like you know, Gao Guo Lin, you know, like stuff like that. It's 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 really crazy. Um, the cheerleaders is a fun part of it. The, the fans love it. The mascots are all just really crazy. Like imagine if every team had a Philly fanatic type mascot, like, like some of them don't make sense. Um, and they're all really fun. Um, even on the TV broadcast without the fans, you know, the team still brought their mascots out um, to, to do funny things like the, the CTBC brothers, their mascot is an elephant. Um, and like during the first game, he would sit behind home plate and he was like ironing his jersey, like doing all of his drugs <laughs> and stuff during the broadcast. He would, during the rain delay, he would go over and like hold his umbrella over the photographers and stuff like, um, you know, the mascots and, and the cheerleaders, um, the fan experience is a huge part of the sport here. 
you know, I definitely love the way that we watch baseball back home. You know, it's, it's, it's relaxed. We can get into it in the moments. You know, the ballpark experience in the States is special. But, you know, they have their own twist on it here, and it's also really special and really fun to be a part of. It's, it's never quiet. It's, it's, it's never quiet here. It, it's, it's kind of wild. So if you like the calm baseball environment back home, maybe this isn't for you. But if, if, you, if you want a little bit more juice, uh, it, it's, it's fun over here. It keeps you locked in. <laughs> yeah, it does. It really does. I, that's funny because in Luxembourg, when I played basketball, it was nonstop drumline. Like, I love drumline. Yeah. All about it. Big fan but drumming the entire game. And I'm like, guys, yeah. can we chill out for like free throws? And yeah. even like during when the home team is batting, they're still just like, they're playing music. Like they will play music during the pitch and stuff. And I'm just like, it's not distracting, but the guys must be, must just get so used to it. Like, so, cause I know like in major league baseball, like you can't play music during the pitch or, or in the NBA or college basketball. Like when action, you have to like stop the music and stuff like that. But here, like noise, noise, noise. They feel like if they're not making noise, they're not doing what they need to be doing for their players. I think that's probably the same in Europe, too. Very committed. They're there for yeah. a purpose. <laughs> yeah, it's great. it's great. We want to be a it. part of it. Yeah. Is there anything that really, really stood out outside of, obviously, the first fan coming to the game, the, the media kind of surrounding her and taking pictures of her? Is there anything else that really stood out to you, either baseball-wise or player-wise, environment-wise, something you took from it? I think – the way that the players responded, you know, after the game, they do a big MVP celebration where the MVP has to dance. And usually they have to interact with the fans while they do it too. Um, and without the fans, they haven't been able to do that. But now with the fans, you know, you can kind of see the players, you know, they're, they're really happy. You know, they know it's not back to normal. They can't interact with the fans directly, but you know, they can still do the pointing and, and you know, the fans will do the, the MVP dance with the players and stuff like that. So uh, that really stood out. And also just the way that um, society as a whole is looking at this as a big step forward. You know, there was a big message from the president of, of, of the country um, to the fans welcoming them back. The head of the Taiwan CDC, um, he's like the task force head of, of COVID-19. He was there. He threw out the first pitch. Um, and this is a big thing for him too, you know, uh, being able to take steps to get the country back to normal uh, as much as possible. Just the way that this is more than baseball really stood out to me. The MVPs have to do a dance? Yeah, so the cheerleaders will do the victory dance. <laughs> the MVP has to stage and try and, and do the coordinated dance. And most of them are really bad at it, so that's part of the fun. <laughs> best part for sure all the pressure and they yeah, probably yeah. hate it <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah the foreign players probably they they definitely like don't like it because it's not stuff you do back in the states but it's really fun when they win the mvp <laughs> oh, i love that i think we should adopt that um i'm just making sure that i'm covering all bases here um yeah. oh yeah are bat flips a thing in taiwan yeah oh yeah last night goggle in hit it hit, hit two home runs second one just but it, yeah, it's, it's, it's casual here. I, in the U.S., it's like a big thing. Like if you flip your bat, it's like, oh my God, that's so disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Here it's like, yeah, it's casual. It's not in your face. They, just, they do it so often that it's not as in your face. But it's cool. Yeah, Gago ended it last night. Definitely fans love it. They love, they love putting on a show for the fans here. And that's what I really like. It seems cool that both sides seem to be really open about putting on a show for each other and helping each other. Do you feel that kind of more so than when you go to a Mariners game? On Obviously, Mariners games, sometimes there'll be 30,000 plus. Yeah. These are smaller crowds, but do you still feel the strength of each other? <laughs> yeah. I you know, like in, in the major leagues, you know, there's so many fans and the players have so much attention with the media and stuff. I definitely understand, you know, major league players, they can't get as intimate with the fans as they might like but you know as, as a Mariners fan you know the way that Felix responded with the crowd and all that stuff you know we love him but here you know because it's a smaller league smaller stadiums not as much attention yeah I mean I mean it's definitely like a like a partnership between the players and and, and the fans here especially uh, the league here has a little bit of a history with with game fixing and stuff and so in the past they've lost a lot of trust with the fans 
So the players now really realize that, you know, they have to step up and, and, and keep the fans and build their trust. And, and I think the fans here are responding to it, especially this year. The way that the players themselves are, are really, you know, committed to, to building this league, grabbing this international attention, and being a part of, of, of the recovery process. Two-part question. How confident do fans seem in the way that Taiwan and, and the professional baseball league there has handled coronavirus and all these extra measures, these um, cautionary measures? How do the fans feel confidence-wise? And how did you feel confidence-wise in terms of how protected you felt um, or if you felt at risk at all? No, I felt very protected. In fact, uh, when I was trying to interview one of the fans during the game, one of the staff came up to me and said, no, 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 come on, no, 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 too close, you're too close. Um, and so, like, I had to sit, like, a couple of seats away from him, and I was speaking a little loudly. But um, I felt very safe, you know. Um, the way that they, they ushered people into the stadium very slowly. Um, everyone had to wear a face mask. So everybody coming into the stadium had to have, had to have this on. Yeah. Um, um, which is good. I mean, it's good. Um, and I think people here are very, very confident. Uh, one of the fans told me, he said, look, if other countries around the world can just do what Taiwan's doing, they can have baseball back too. Um, and obviously it's a little more complicated than that, different countries, different situations, but, um, you know, I, they're really proud of what they're doing here in Taiwan. Um, and so I think everyone felt pretty safe. It, it's gone really well. Um, Everything I'm hearing is that the, the Taiwanese CDC is going to look at slowly expanding it. Because, uh, you know, uh, teams are losing a lot of revenue um, without fans coming in the ballpark. You know, it's not like MLB where it's all TV money. They get a lot of their money from fans at the park. So I think the CDC realizes that they want to do it safely. They want to help the teams. And I think it's just a big government team player fan partnership. And it's really cohesive here. It seems like they're definitely setting a good path toward coming back to normal a little bit or allowing fans in. But what do you see as the biggest, biggest bouts of adversity, I guess, in terms of bringing it to the United States, the MLB, you're traveling cross country or, you know, and there were some ideas of doing to, you know, Arizona and Florida. Um, what do you think? Just, I know it's a lot of pressure to try and create, solve the problem right here, but what would you tell them right now? Well, I mean, it's all about player safety. I mean, the, the first thing that the, the, the Taiwanese league did before they even thought about fans was making sure that the players were safe, that there were precautions for players in place, and that the players felt safe before they could start playing. Now, it was a little easy here because all the players were kind of already in Taiwan where there weren't a lot of cases. And I know that's not the case in the United States. Um, so I, I know the MLB is in a much tougher situation. Um, but they just need to get to a point where the players feel safe you know, I don't know if it's it's a situation where you use 10 stadiums instead of all 30. Um, I think once you figure out the, the situation with the players, you, the stadiums are so big that you can you can let a thousand fans in and, and socially distance them and, and stuff like that. I, I think that's something that's possible, but it's all about the players uh, and, and the staff feeling safe and protected first. And, and that's something that we did really well here in Taiwan. That definitely makes sense. So, Guardians, are you their number one new fan? Got it. This, this is this is my team. Yeah, there's four teams. Uh, we got the you, so our teams here are sponsored by by corporations. So we got the Uni President Lions, which is the company that owns all the 7-Elevens in Taiwan. 7-Eleven is very huge here in Taiwan. Um, they're in a city called Tainan down in the south. We got the China Trust Bank Brothers, uh, the elephants. They're in the middle of the country. The Rakuten Monkeys, which are the, uh, the most successful team right now. And Fubon is a bank. I'm a Fubon Guardians fan. They're the closest team here in, uh, to Taipei City. Um, so this is my team. Fortunately, we're not doing too well. Uh, we have a losing record. But uh, you know what? We're going to turn it around. Plus, I'm a Mariners fan, so I already know all about <laughs> okay. Spoken okay. like a true Mariners fan. <laughs> oh, go Nurse. Still love them. Absolutely. It's going to make yeah. it that much more, spe more special when they win the World Series and when Fubon wins the, what is it Taiwan called? Series. Taiwan Series. Taiwan Series. Okay. Yeah, Fubon Taiwan Series this year. Next season, uh, Marco Gonzalez, Cy Young Award, and we're going to win the World Series. 
<laughs> I love it. <laughs> book it. Book and play. Zaga boy. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Marco's awesome. He's such a good guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah I got um, to talk to him last year when I covered the game in Japan. Oh, no way. Yeah, yeah. So there's a story on the spokesman about um, uh, Marco getting his first start as the number one pitcher uh, yeah. from last season. So everyone go check out that story. Absolutely. So cool. Um, all right. Well, Sean, I think that's uh, all I have for you. You answered so many questions. I'm really excited to see how this transpires and how many different leagues in the world, the Bundesliga and, you know, German basketball league is about to start up to get again. And yeah. there's just so much to be learned from, I guess, Taiwan and pretty cool yeah. for a small country like that to be setting the standard. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of it. Um, and I just, I hope, I really do hope that other countries around the world can experience this because sports can bring people together, um, you know, but we need to do it safely and we need to do it in a way that people are protected. And uh, I, yeah, I'm really hopeful that sports can, can start up again. Cool. I'm going to stop recording now.